Hi, this is Uncle Matt's D&D Studio. I'm Matt Finch, and this is part two of my series of videos with Greg Gillespie, who, unknown to me at the time that we set this whole uh, interview up, is actually a professor who teaches courses about the history and culture of RPGs. Uh, for this, uh, again, this is the second one in the series. If you're not already subscribed uh, to the Uncle Matt's D&D Studio channel, uh, please go ahead and subscribe to it. And in this one, we're going to be talking about mega dungeons and mega dungeon theory. And um, so, Greg, one thing is go ahead and uh, when we're not talking, let's mute the microphones so that we don't. Since we're on Google Hangout, every time it detects a noise, it's going to flip back and forth between the two of us. So let's uh, we'll try and keep the microphones on mute until we're talking, then click off mute so that we don't have that flipping back and forth thing going on. Got it. So, all right. Uh, for... Starting off, we got in the first one of these videos, we talked uh, about the fact that you've got the two large Mega Dungeon product projects, um, Forbidden Caverns of Archaea and uh, Baramays further back in time. And um, uh, in both cases, you had addressed different approaches to the two things. Baramays was based on a sort of a sprawl uh, concept that didn't necessarily have the the, the uh, the demarcated levels, and um, and then Archaea, which is using a different sort of approach to the things, and you were talking about more of a, uh, a Caves of Chaos Keep on the Borderland kind of organization. And um, the other thing that you talked about was simply that it was a, that a Mega Dungeon was something where, uh, no matter what it was that the players decided to do when they came to the gaming session, um, by having a Mega Dungeon, you would have something that they could start... Um, approaching from all of the various different uh, approaches. So um, starting with that last one, you, you raised the issue of what's often called sandbox gaming in a mega dungeon. So why don't we just start out, since it's something that you raised, let's talk about the sandbox aspect of, um, of a mega dungeon. And obviously you've given a lot of thought to structure. So let's, let's talk about that structurally. Sure. Uh, I think, <clears throat> well, for me, there are a few different things that inform my approaches to design. So um, preceding a notion of whether something's a mega dungeon or a smaller adventure, I, uh, I like I, I think of uh, Dungeons and Dragons in its in its uh, and its retro clones and their basic format are um, are there's charm in that basic format. I think the the game that Gygax and Arneson made there's inherent value in um, and depth in what a lot of people would probably just label as a vanilla medieval fantasy. I think I don't see that as a set of constraints. I see it as a set of enablements. And I think that there's a lot of room to work within that milieu. So a lot of the stuff that I do is not particularly gonzo or uh, out there because I just don't really see the need for it in the style of game that I enjoy. Um, so that's the, those are some of the things that inform my approach and I think it resonates uh, with a certain segment of the OSR. Oh, I, I definitely, I definitely think it does resonate, and that's part of the thing um, why why I ask about the sandbox and the mega dungeon is that a lot of people will make the distinction between, um, in addition to you know urban and wilderness adventuring, they'll often make a distinction between a lair um, and uh, and and a mega dungeon. So, I mean, even stepping back one point further, if you had to make that distinction between a lair. And a mega dungeon. Although I'm give, I'm sort of forcing the uh, the terminology on you. But if you had to make that distinction, what would you say makes something a mega dungeon? Um, multitude of choice. So um, I, I there are different ways of presenting sandboxes, and we often think of it in terms of the wilderness sort of sandbox. Which direction do you want to go? Sort of thing. But that logic can very easily be brought to the to the mega dungeon, um, different passages moving in different directions, um, uh, almost maze-like in their complexity. So that uh, opportunity for which direction do you want to go and what potentially might you encounter, hazards, monsters, you know, unique or whatever, uh, that's all available to you in the mega dungeon. Uh, so the, the layer I would see more uh, if we're going to use the sandbox analogy a little bit more as a railroad where uh, there's a layer for a specific monster and that monster is harassing the town and off you go to try to defeat it or whatever. Um, the, the mega dungeon uh, to me emphasizes exploration. And now, okay, so now, so we've got that um, complexity issue that you raised in terms of the sandboxing. Do you think that can be overdone? 
Um, in, in Mega Dungeons or just generally? In in Mega Dungeons, if if what you're uh, if what you're doing is a sandboxing approach, um, and and you're offering the the various choices as a design feature, is there a point at which there is over complexity? Or not? I, I would tend to say no, actually. But I, it's it, you know, what what's your feeling on that? No, I think the more choices, the, the more and varied the choices, the more engaging and dynamic the environment. Absolutely. Okay. So um, so we're we're pretty much on, in, in agreement on that. I I have run into the situation um, where I had groups of players who said, you know, I need some sort of mission being given to me, not because I think that, uh, you know, railroading is necessarily good, but I need a, a starter. I need something to get me going on the mission. How, uh, and, and one of the things about a mega dungeon is that players can define their own missions. What do you do or do you do something um, in terms of letting a group that's not sure what they want to do um, have something to hook themselves into on, on that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, I might provide an initial hook, um, or I might f frame the beginning of the game such that it suggests uh, the reason why they might go. Um, but ha having said that, I think that uh, a game like a Mega Dungeon has to be uh, player-centered. Um, I believe that Playing a bit of a mega dungeon, if you have a group of people that are thinking sort of in an exploration mode, uh, the missions will suggest themselves. They'll be like, we ran into some undead down that passageway. There could be some tombs or something. So next week we're going to plan to go over there. Or uh, we tried to go over this area and we ran into some monsters. So we're definitely not going over to that area. So I think that um, it can suggest itself. And I think also if if players are floundering a bit in that, you, that's your opportunity to, you know, have somebody approach them in town that could provide some sort of hook or something. So, um, like I, for me, I like the notion of I, I situate adventures as sort of uh, like gladiators were in ancient Rome. You know, on one hand, they were held up by Roman society for their bravery and their courage, and yet on the other hand, they were vilified for selling their bodies. Mm -hmm. So they were held up on one hand and vilified on the other. And I see adventures sort of in the same way, tomb robbers, insofar as um, they're not really up to getting a real job. And in a way, they are putting their lives at risk for potential reward. Now, the and the thing there, too, is that um, if you're the a mega dungeon is is almost. Um, almost by definition suited toward uh, that tomb robber concept because there's normally not any particularly heroic mission involved uh, in a mega dungeon. Whereas if you're going for a more, his uh, a, a more heroic sort of party, uh, then those layers are going to be more of a, uh, the way to go simply because, you know, there you're dealing with something that's presumably a danger to the community and so on and so forth. So, I mean, are, are mega dungeons inherently more uh, of the sort of, we're going to make our fortune um, by hook or by crook kind of adventuring? Uh, for me, one of the other foundational items that informs my understanding of the game is uh, that, uh, that I prefer low fantasy over uh, high fantasy. Again, to each their own, to everybody out there that enjoy, enjoys their form of gaming. But for me, I find the moral ambiguity of low fantasy to be humorous. I think it fits with some of the origin stories I've heard about the hobby. And uh, it works against sort of the direction that Dungeons and Dragons took with the uh, Hickmans and Dragonlands and second edition, and that which is just sort of carried forward. And then you also see the reflection in the art um, for high fantasy versus sort of low fantasy. So I think, uh, again, I, I try to uh, uh, acknowledge the, the roots of the hobby and the people that created the game um, by trying to structure what I'm doing in a manner that uh, fits my understanding of what they were doing at the time. All right, awesome. So um, we are, again, running into one of the little time slots um, that we've been doing here and we'll certainly have more uh, about mega dungeon theory in general because i think it's a, a really huge topic with a lot of people in the osr even if it's not necessarily about uh, 
uh, mega dungeons being better. There's just a lot of curiosity about why does this uh, sort of approach work so well. And so we will have a lot more on that. Uh, we're going to go to a third video, which is just going to be the one now where we do the uh, the post briefing on on the interview and uh, you know get a, a, a better sense for uh, what everyone looks like when they've got their hair down. So uh, for the time being, let me say once again, the normal closing off of whatever type of D&D &D it is that you play, imagine the hell out of it.